I'm glad to be in the house of God tonight. Go over, please, to the Gospel of Matthew in the 13th chapter, according to the Gospel of St. Matthew tonight, beginning there with verse 37, amen. Praise the Lord God, amen. Verse 37 says, He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man, the field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Titled tonight of the message is Reapers of a Furnace of Fire. Reapers of a Furnace of Fire. Let's pray. Father God, we stand in your presence tonight. We do not offer superb intellect, talents, or abilities. We stand in your presence tonight, God, seeking your anointing, seeking your presence, God, to be our guide, to be our salvation, to be our strength. Mighty God, speak in and through us tonight by your word. As we yield to your spirit, God, let us not just hear the letter, God, but let us experience the spirit that is in the letter. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. Reapers of a furnace of fire. This morning we taught you on the the wheat and the tares or the wheat. And the weeds, and I won't re-preach that tonight. But to begin with, if you're a believer tonight, and I believe most of you are, I believe everybody here is a believer tonight, then you are considered to be the golden grain in the kingdom of God. But we have to understand to begin with, as we talk about an eternal reaping of fire that will take place for the ungodly, First of all, let me address again the fact that we as believers, we sow good seed. And if we sow good seed, then we're going to have a harvest of good things. If you sow bad seed as a believer, then you will have a bad harvest even as a believer. Because the law of the seed is whatsoever you sow, that shall you also reap. So when we sow, we need to understand that there's a law that God has put in place. That when we sow something in this life, there is going to be a reaping. There is going to be a harvest. What you sow, that shall you also reap. If we sow to the flesh, we shall of the flesh reap corruption. If we sow to the Spirit, we shall of the Spirit reap life eternal. And so, first of all, you reap what you sow. Number two, you reap what you sow at a different time from when you sowed it. That means what you sow today, if it's good, it may come up a week or a month or a year from now, 10 years, 15 years from now. If you sow bad seed as a believer. There will be a reaping at a different time from the time that you sowed it. It may be a week, a month, a year, 10 years, 20 years down the road. But there will be a reaping that will come at a different time than you sow, number two. Number three, everything that we sow in life, whether it be good or bad, seed, ultimately is more than what you sowed. 
because that's the law of the seed. If you sow a seed into the ground, it's going to produce a harvest of seeds. Amen. So we reap what we sow, number one. Number two, we reap it at a different time. And number three, you always reap more than you sow. So if you sow good, one good thing is going to come up ten times or more that same thing. Amen. If you bless somebody, then ten other people are going to bless you. If you curse somebody, then somewhere down the road, ten people are going to curse you. Because there is a law in God that you and I cannot avoid. And that's the law of sowing and reaping. Say praise God. That's why it's very important for us to understand that what we say with our mouths, what we do with our lives, what we have in our attitude, in our spirit is extremely important. Because we cannot get away from the fact that we will reap what we sow. We'll reap it at a different time and we'll reap more than what we sowed. Give God praise in this house. That is why, brothers and sisters, that as believers in Christ, at times you will go through great suffering. You will have great trouble in your life. And you will ask the question, why? Normally, if you'll go back in time, you sowed some seed at some point in your life. That is now coming up with a manifold harvest of sorrow and pain. The good news is that the believer will not experience the bad harvest in eternity forever and ever. But if you will, the bad news is that we live in time. And because of that law of the seed, you and I will reap in this time, a short period of time, what we have sowed, whether it be good or bad. That means sometimes that's why you'll see believers have so much trouble and so much sorrow in their life. It is because they have sowed seeds in the past that is now causing them to have a harvest. And it has to take place within time on this earth because they will not experience that. I will not, you will not in eternity. What do you do when you begin to harvest, uh, when you have a harvest in your life? From something that you have sowed somewhere in the past. What do you do with that is critical. Number one, when you begin to have a harvest of sorrow and pain that comes into your life, you can sit in a corner and you can get depressed. And you can feel sorry for yourself. But if you do that, what will happen is you'll become useless to the kingdom of God. The second approach to a harvest is when you have that, you look at that harvest and you justify it. And you say, you know, that's just who I am. I can't change who I am. I'm not going to try to change the way I am. And when you take that approach to a harvest, you will have that harvest repeated in your life a hundred times over and over and over. The third way is the way you want to approach it. When you begin to have a harvest in your life from the seeds that you have sowed in your past of pain and sorrow, etc., you want to go to God and say, God, I admit that the pain and the suffering that I'm experiencing in my life right now is as a result of something that I sowed in my life. Lord, I admit it. I confess it. And so now, God, I ask you to take this harvest and burn it up. I take this harvest. I ask you to dispose of this harvest that's in my life. But most people don't do that. Most people sit in a corner and just get depressed, you know, because the harvest they have and become useless to God. Or most people justify who they are and their actions, and they never change. They refuse to change. Therefore, it keeps happening over and over and over again because there is a sowing that you are doing in your life. Oh, God, tonight have mercy on us. He will forgive you when you plant that seed of sin. He will forgive you when you plant that seed. He forgives that. Amen. So we don't have eternal consequence. But he allows a harvest to continue to grow. That's why you've got to be careful with your spirit, with your attitude, with your words, everything. Because you are sowing. And I'm sowing in my life for a future harvest. But tonight I want to focus on the harvest of the lost. I want to focus upon individuals that will not only reap in time 
from the seeds that they have sown, the bad seeds of the tares, the darnel, the seeds of the evil one, the sons of the devil, because they never became born again, regenerated by the power of the gospel. These individuals are lost people. And God talks about a time in the end when he'll send his raper angels forth and he will separate the wheat from the tares. He will take the golden grain of the sons of God and put them in the heavenly Jerusalem called his barn. But the lost, the tares, the sons of the wicked one, the children of the devil, he will take them and he will put them, as Jesus said, into a furnace of fire. And therefore it will be an eternal reaping, not only just a harvest for their sin, but the actual sin itself has placed them in a place of eternal fire and damnation. This part of the text is not like as. This is real fire. Jesus didn't say it was like fire. He said it was fire, brothers and sisters. This is where the lost is going to be. And they're going to reap forever and ever and ever and ever in that place called hell. They won't be able to get out forever and ever and ever and ever. They will reap the, the sin that they sowed in their life forever and ever and ever and ever. They won't be able to get out. And they'll be in hell and, and they will heal the demon power that are there you're in hell and you can't get out you're in hell and you can't get out you're in hell and you can't get out and forever and ever and ever they will be reaping in that fire eternal damnation because they are reaping a, a lifestyle of sin do you understand what Jesus says in his word it is a literal fire it's not like fire it's a literal fire Amen. That's the reaping of the sinner. Oh, we need to be thankful tonight for the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. We need to be thankful tonight for the forgiveness of sin. It is important to us for us to understand how important it is tonight that we are forgiven for our sin. We need to be thankful tonight for what the blood of Jesus Christ did for us on a cross and redeeming our souls from destruction, eternal damnation. In the Gospels, and Jesus is the one who's speaking this about this eternal furnace of fire that these, amen, Darnell will be cast into. <coughs> In the Gospels themselves, 66 times Love is mentioned in the Gospels, but 45 times hell is mentioned. A place called Gehenna. It's a picture of a garbage dump where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. That means in that garbage dump there's always plenty for the worms to continue to eat. And the outside of Jerusalem walls in Gehenna the garbage dump. And the fires kept burning and the worms kept eating all of the garbage that was there. Jesus is saying that is what it's going to be like. It's going to be a furnace of fire. It's Gehenna. It's a garbage dump. And the worms will continue to eat. Because they will have plenty to eat forever and ever and ever. The worms gnawing at the flesh of your conscience. Eating at you. If you find yourself in that place. Your memory will will come back and haunt you. Your conscience will come back and speak to you. You will remember the things that you did in your life against God and now you're reaping it and those worms of your conscience are constantly eating away at you. When Jesus talked about hell, he talked about it as a literal place. A place not where you go and are annihilated and are just immediately burned up when you are thrown there. He talked about it being an eternal furnace of fire. He talked about it being everlasting. Not something where a person is just destroyed and burned up. But a place where you will suffer forever and ever and ever. The reapings of your decisions and choices to sin against God Almighty and not be saved. It's a message today that a lot of people in the pews don't believe. I got a question for you tonight. Do you really believe it? Do I really believe it? 
Oh, we say with our mouths that we believe in that place called hell. We say with our mouths that we believe an eternal furnace of fire. We say that, but do we live like it? Jesus said, it's an eternal furnace of fire. The Jewish writers, there were two main schools of thought in the days of Jesus. Those two schools of thought believed that no Jewish person could ever go to hell. It didn't really matter if you were of Shammai or if you were Hillel uh, school of thought. Uh, both schools said there was, there's just no way that any Jewish person would ever go to hell. And so when Jesus would begin to preach, he, re- he said to the Jewish people there, he said, don't fall for that. Because there's going to be some Jews also. He, uh, in the 8th chapter, the sons of the kingdom that will be cast into outer darkness. He said there's going to be some Jews in hell. But there were times where those two schools taught. They didn't believe that that would happen. And one of them was Shammai, the other was uh, Hillel. And what they believed was there was three groups of people. The first group, they said, was people that had eternal life. The second group of people were those that were going to be damned in hell forever because they were completely evil. But they said there was a third group, and they called them the middle group. And this middle group, they said, were people who had an even balanced life. That means that uh, uh, their good and their bad balanced out equally. And they said, Shammai said and Hillel said, that for that middle group of people, that they would go to hell only for a temporary period of time. And then God, after a a short period of time of suffering there, that that middle group of people would be brought out of hell. But that's not what Jesus taught. In Matthew 13, he said there's only two. Either you're lost or you're saved. Either you're the wheat or you're the tares. Come on, give God praise in the house. Either you're the true sons of the kingdom or you're an imitator. You're an actor and you don't really have the goods. So I'll read it to you so you'll understand what I'm talking about. The house of Shammai say there are three classes. One for eternal life. One for shame and eternal abomination. Those are the completely evil people. The evenly balanced uh, of those, they go down to Gehenna and they squeal and they rise as they are healed. As it is said, I will bring the third through the fire and refine them like silver is refined and test them like gold is tested. They will call on my name and I will be God to them. And that's Zechariah 13. And concerning them, Hannah says, The Lord kills, the Lord makes alive, bringing down to Sheol, and he brings up again. The second school of thought, Hillel, said it this way. He who is great in mercy inclines toward mercy. And concerning them, David says, I love the Lord because he hears me. She all laid hold of me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. When I was brought low, he saved me. That's Psalm 116. And so the point is that both schools believed that if you were an evenly balanced person, that you would only go into hell temporarily and then you would come out. Hillel was a little bit more merciful in their view. And they focused on the mercy of God. And they said, well, the middle group is actually going to be a little bit bigger than what Shammai says. Because they said God's going to show mercy even on those who the bad outweighed the good just a little bit. If your bad outweighed your good just a little bit, Hillel said uh, uh, that you would come out uh, in that third group uh, out of that place of suffering and be saved. But that is not what Jesus said. And when Jesus came, 
that was in the mindset of the Jews. No Jewish person would be, be lost. Everybody would be saved. And Jesus said, no, you have to understand. There are not three groups of people. There's only two. It's going to be the lost and the saved. The saved and the lost. No middle ground. No people who've lived a life. Were they sort of evenly balanced, you know? No, Jesus said, no, according to this parable, you're either in the kingdom of God or you're in the kingdom of darkness. You're a son of God or you're a son of the devil. There is no middle ground with Jesus Christ. And he said, the place that you go to is a furnace of fire. And it's literal fire. It's not like fire. It is fire. 